Hello everyone. Tonight we're going to be talking about planting design. So last class we talked a lot about the functional use bubbling and we're going to take it from there with adding planting design to that. So this is kind of the second part of we've gathered our data and thought about how we're going to use our space and now we're going to target our water use and understand how the principles of designs relate to plant material to enhance our planned area. So again, the ETO in San Diego, um, that's our evapotranspiration rate or how much water plants sweat varies depending if you're close to the coast or inland. So along the coastal strand, we could expect a patch of healthy cool season turf to use about 33 inches of water. Yet if we get out into kind of the Poway Valley Center area, um, that's this actually this foothill area, we can expect that same turf to use about 55 inches of water a year. And that's important because in our region, we average about 10 inches per year. And you can see the vast majority of it happens in kind of midwinter, early spring in our region. And then we get very, very little through the summer months. So when we manage our um, water use, we find our, our outdoor water use that about 70% of household water is used outdoors. So, you know, Targeting those high water use species like turf or other plants really can create a lot of water savings. So we want to look at um, water conservation related to how much water do the plants we've selected use and how efficient is our irrigation system. So when we have a high efficiency irrigation system and very low water use plants, we end up with this multiple star water use rating. So quick word on irrigation efficiency, our traditional overhead sprays are considered low efficiency or high precipitation, which is just like it sounds. It means that these types of heads put out a lot of water quickly or fast rain, so fast that water can't usually absorb into the soil and it tends to move off laterally into the street. Newer technology is our low precipitation uh, overhead sprays. Um, these are kind of like stream rotors. They kind of have a circular pattern. Um, these put out water much more slowly and you run them longer, but the water stays in the place you're applying it. And then our most efficient types of irrigation is drip irrigation or bubblers because they have a very low output of water. We're talking gallons per hours with drip irrigation versus gallons per minute with overhead spray. So when we look at plants and we want to design for water conservation, we're looking at our native and adapted species, which are generally very low. Low is also native species or plants from similar climates. Um, depending on where what ecosystem our plants are coming from they might be in low or medium water use even natives and then our kind of standard horticultural species um, is this is what you traditionally have seen for many many years um, used in our region would be medium turf is considered medium high as are those heavy tropicals like papyrus and canna and things we don't see a lot of these days after the last round of droughts. So just kind of a glimpse on very low water use plant material. There's some succulent um, strategies for water conservation. Um, they can be leafy and green, so they don't have to be dry and dusty and gray looking, but they can be. Depends on what your preference is. Here's our low water use plant material. So again, some succulents, um, but some of the colorful plants certainly fall in this category. And then our traditional moderate water use plant material. And then our high water use plant material, again, that being turf and some of these big ferns. So we talked last week about shaping functional spaces and thinking about, especially residential sites, is it an outdoor room, a passageway or a garden? 
and we talked about some of the characteristics of what a room might look like, um, pathways and how to make them interesting. Um, uh, view gardens, maybe it's an area where you don't want to be outside and you just want to look at something pretty. Um, or is it a view garden where you're pulling in distant views? That's also a view garden to borrow the landscape beyond. Um, and that form follows function and thinking about are there active or passive uses and thinking about your area as one whole space. So like a master plan for this whole garden. So again, this is repeating, thinking about the different amenities that you might want in a space. We looked at some of these bubble diagrams last week and how to plan for where the circulation is going to go and where an outdoor room might go, whether we want to integrate stormwater into it, um, whether we need screening, all of these different examples, and how to go from, um, I'm not sure that we got to this part, so the way that you start applying um, forms to these bubbles to create some interest is you might draw an underlying grid. So here's our bubble diagram and then we've created a 90 degree grid underneath it and then you kind of just start to clip out spaces within this grid to create a rectangular design. Rectangular designs work with a lot of different materials. It's considered a man-made or a geometric form but it works well if you think about, you know, here we've got decking or brick or tile. It usually is in a square or rectangle type pattern. We've got angular and hexagonal forms. This is getting more popular again, resurgence with the interest in mid-century modern. Um, so for that, we might create, you know, first a grid at 90 degrees and then add some 45 degrees in there and we could come in and clip out some of these unusual angles. The thing that's important in angular designs is to try and keep our angles above 90 degrees. When we start creating little slivers of spaces, those get really uncomfortable and they also are really difficult to either irrigate or install hardscape. Hardscape tends to crack. Irrigation doesn't do so well when it's dialed down into this narrow sliver. So best to avoid those narrow slivers in design. Um, circular forms, um, if we were going to create a, we wanted that type of form to our bubbled out space, we might create like a spider web looking grid, a radial grid, and then use that to kind of pull out different spaces in our design. So it can get, kind of add a lot of interest to like this little small space to add a radial form to it. And circles, a lot of people like this for passive gardens. It tends to be a little bit calmer and more restful than some of the rectangular and angular geometric forms. And then we have the organic meander, which is very smooth back and forth transitions inspired by nature. You see this being used a lot in the dry creek beds or pathways, um, but the planting can certainly take this kind of organic meander through the landscape. Again, this tends to have a more restful feel to people who would be in that space. It's not so rigid and formal, so people tend to feel a little bit more relaxed in spaces like this. And now we get into the language of planting design. And for those of you who've taken other art classes or specialized in I know we've got graphic design represented, represented. you're going to recognize this terminology and it's the same concept but different materials we use to apply. So the main ones we're going to talk about are color form, texture, line, and density. So colors used to attract attention, influence emotion, and add a harmony to a scene. Cool colors are calming and relaxing and make the landscape appear to recede, so space might look bigger. Warm colors are energizing and they make the landscape appear closer or appear to advance um, into your experience or your view frame. Texture is the surface quality of the plant material. And I, I like to say almost like the roughness of the plant material, or actually it can be hardscape materials or wall materials too. 
So we rank texture as something being coarse, medium, or fine. And so you can see these big, big philodendron leaves, those have a very coarse texture. Each of these leaves reads as a whole. Um, this Boston Ivy tends to have a medium texture. And this is a very wispy, oh, it looks like a coleanema, a bre pink breath of heaven to me. So very fine texture. So when we start to mix textures, we can create a lot of interest in the landscape, even if we're only working with kind of green leafy material and not color. So it's another strategy to add interest into our landscape. Line and point. So a line is a series of points, and it's what draws our eye through a landscape. Um, so um, sometimes we create a focal point, so a very strong attention-getting thing in the landscape, or we might create an interesting line for our eye to follow. And you can see this, your two neighbors who have very different styles, but you've got this contrast with the blood grass and this silvery, it's almost like a thyme, like a woolly thyme, and the fact that this organic line kind of marches through that creates a really striking attention getting composition. And on this side, this neighbor has a very formal line, you know, a straight line of these little tiny sheared, almost topiary shrubs. Um, so two different uses of lines, one next to each other, and it, and it really is a matter of preference most of the time of you know, which works maybe with the architecture or the mood you're trying to set on a landscape. But when we create these rows of planting, that provides structure and interest to the design. And if you have a dead corner in a property, you can create views. And this is an example of points, you know, so maybe this empty fenced corner, you know, this person's taken a bench and painted it blue and put a little birdhouse in this salvaged ironwork and created a nice little vignette in that corner. Maybe there's a window that looks out onto that space and suddenly you've, you've created a, a, a focal point or a viewpoint for them. Same with this cluster of bubbling urns, you know, nice little spot of interest in a big grand entry on a house. Density is how much light it can penetrate a planted area or a tree canopy. So if we think about this as our vertical walls of our room, are those walls very dense, like this lower one where it's a sheared wall of shrubs and this is literally like a wall. There's not gonna be any light penetrating that. It feels like a solid block wall. It's very dense. Unlike this one has a different feeling. It's like a bamboo forest and, and light can still filter through it and it creates a different experience even though they have these walls of vegetation. So impenetrable shrubs can provide a sense of security if they're used in the correct location. And that's why you see a lot of the movie stars using these um, as a way to kind of protect their privacy. Form, so if we're talking about form related to plants, we have many different shapes of plants, um, especially our trees. We can have vertical or columnar trees. Those might be palm trees or Italian cypress trees. Here's a cedar. This is a nice example of a pyramidal shaped tree. We have round or globular shaped trees. Weeping, this has a bit of a weeping characteristic. This is a, a California pepper. It weeps a bit like a willow. It's also, I would say, picturesque too, because it is a statement tree. It has this irregular structure. I would say an oak tree has a very picturesque structure. And you can have upright or spreading types of forms on our plant material um, and add interest to the landscape in addition to texture and color. So we also look at how the landscape's ordered. So in very classical designs, you would have a symmetrical design, meaning that everything is balanced um, from one side to another. It's almost like a mirrored, it doesn't have to exactly be a mirror, but we would call this a formal axial design. And it provides this feeling of formality. 
it is not a very necessarily um, relaxing, restful space. It's an interesting space. Um, if you go and look at Balboa Park and you walked in some of the courtyards, they're in a very formal design with these boxed wood hedges and planting in the middle. And, and if you went there and you saw how that felt in comparison to, oh, maybe the big lawn areas over by the puppet theater, where it's just a scattering of trees and lawns and rolling hills, that has a very different feel to it. Or some of the cactus gardens that are out there, they're not um, symmetrical designs, they're more of an what we call asymmetrical. So when we use symmetry in our design, um, we create a feeling of formality in our design work. Asymmetrical is unequal, but that doesn't mean unbalanced. So it still has a visual weight to the design, um, and it feels dynamic, it creates movement, and has a casual and formal feel. So this is a bit harder to convey, I think, via lecturing remotely on video. But some nice examples of asymmetrical design are the Vietnam War Memorial, where there's this just very simple kind of scar in the land. And as you drop down in elevation, all the names of the soldiers who were injured and killed in action are listed. And, you know, you end up in this very tall wall of names and that becomes a very powerful experience and this design was meant to reflect by the wound of that war on us on our culture um, and done by a, a very famous designer now called Maya Lin um, who at the time won it while she was a she won a competition while she was a graduate student in, lands, in architecture I believe um, this is at UCSD. It's a really wonderful courtyard. Again, a very asymmetrical design. So you can see that it's everything's not mirrored. It's, it has connections for paths, but they're they're a little bit more irregular. But it doesn't feel unbalanced. It still has a nice dynamic feel to it. Um, we like to put a lot of plants together. Um, so that we can create massing um, and that provides a sense of order and a stronger statement. Um, so here's an example at Lotus Land with a bunch of cactuses grouped together. You see this in classical design with an alley of trees or a double row of trees. Um, this is a park in New York that's very famous called Bryant Park and there's just a massing of of little small seasonal flowering trees that go through flower and uh, autumn fall color cycles and creates this beautiful overhead plane. But it is because they're massed in what we call a bosque of trees, it creates an interesting environment. And then dominance is an important factor in landscape design. So I don't know how many of you have had the good fortune to be in Balboa Park and wander down the Prado and the fountain was going. And that's a very dominant feature down that corridor. You can see it all the way down from even the art museum. And as you draw as it, you closer, um, you, you, and you're close to it, you see the grand scale of that. So that's what we mean by dominance. By adding something that is a large statement piece, you create this focal point and interest to the landscape. And here, this is at the Getty Museum in, in Malibu where they have their classic collection. So you can see this long, you know, white marble, very light colored plaster in the pool. And then down at the end, there's this bronze sculpture that's black almost. So there's a size and a color that's making this dominant in that landscape and creating interest. And again, we look at that beautiful picturesque California willow by the mission a very dominant feature in that landscape. So we've got some quick garden themes to think about. So first you have your formal gardens. This is symmetrical arrangements of plants, paving and color. Shrubs a lot of times in these gardens are modified um, to form topiaries or hedges. And many times these were designed to be viewed from above. So you would have the noble floor of many 
you know, nobility houses or royal houses, and that was the entertainment floor. So you would go up to the second level, this is at Versailles, and look down upon the landscape. So a lot of these were meant to be almost like looking at a Persian carpet of planting and flowers. So they can be quite interesting and have very simple patterns or very complex um, scrolling patterns. Then we have the cottage garden, characterized by rhythm and repetition in plant color and textures. So it's interesting to note in traditional landscape design, we really try and limit how many different types of plants that we use in one space. Um, cottage gardens are the exception to that. And these are actually very complex gardens because they're not using the same plant material re uh, repeating. They are using seasonality of colors and textures to tie the, all these different species together. So there's a lot of planning that goes into making a cottage garden look good. Um, and it is dependent on seasonal changes in flower and foliage, gained popularity in the arts and crafts era of the 1890s. Um, Asian gardens usually have clean, simple lines, fine attention to detail in regard to materials, constructions, and vistas. They might um, also include culturally significant symbolic landscapes. So there are periods in Asia that maybe the nobility was not allowed to go travel to other areas. Um, so they might be stuck at their houses, their big estates, and they would actually build recreations of places that they'd visit, visited in the past in miniature to help remind them of that, um, that, those trips and those good times. So that kind of became part of their culture um, and is reflected in their landscape design. This is of the Japanese Friendship Garden, which was done by a wonderful 14th generation garden master named Takeo Asugi. He was one of the teachers at Cal Poly Pomona when I was there, um, and this is one of his early gardens. He was involved to a degree in the expansion, but if you like Asian gardens, it's a really wonderful example of a traditional garden to visit. And in the center, right here, this little island, this is in the old part of the garden at the top. If you look carefully, this is shaped like a turtle. And so a turtle, I don't remember what a turtle represents, it's not longevity, it's something else, um, but that was intentional and symbolic in the garden. So you might see things like that also in Asian garden design. Tropical gardens. So just because we live in an arid climate doesn't mean we can, can't have a tropical effect garden. And I think all of these are pretty good examples of dry gardens that have a tropical effect. So. When I think about visiting the rainforest, I think about lush green plant material that has big leaves. There's no need to conserve water, so their leaves grow big. And it also has a lot of brightly colored flowers or foliage to attract pollinators in a pretty dark under, understory. So those are kind of adaptations to a rainforest type or tropical climate. So we can mimic those effects with water conserving plants in our region. I mean, in this case, this is the um, foxtail agave, and it's this big green rosette of succulents. But it, in this setting with all the color and the bougainvillea, it looks very tropical. Here's some of the birds of paradise, and those certainly, once they're established, the water use drops way down. A lot of kind of almost fern-like planting in this one. Um, here's bromeliads. Those work better coastally with well-draining soil. But, um, you know, some great examples of getting that effect without the water use. Mediterranean gardens. Um, this is what a lot of people think of lo as low water gardens in our areas. Lots ex of examples looking over into Europe, into southern Italy and southern France. Um, and, and beautiful uses of terracotta and rock and kind of the olives and the rosemary and the lavender. So we see a lot of this in Southern California. And I think it, it um, works well with our regional water cycle. So less formal arrangement of these plants. 
and not as much shearing as some of the like more classical garden is, is one big difference too. They tend to have a lot of green gray color. These pictures in particular don't, but a lot of times you see a lot of green grays in this Mediterranean landscape. Native gardens. Um, using regionally native plant material support, supports our local fauna and pollinators. And we can add structural components like rocks or garden tolerant varieties um, to kind of hold the form of these gardens when it goes into its summer decline. So that is some people don't and ultimately don't like natives because they get some of them can get a bit dry and crispy in the summertime. And that is a water conservation strategy. That is not really any different than if you lived in the Midwest and your trees dropped all their leaves and kind of turned kind of you just saw the gray bark in the winter months. It's it's going into dormancy to survive conditions that make it tough to grow. Our native plants, some of them do the same thing. So some of them can look absolutely spectacular in spring, but when you get to this time of year, they look like they're dead and dry and crispy. That's not all of them. That's a lot of our coastal sage scrub species do that. But you know, if we get inland, we see um, varieties that hold their green color a little bit better. So, you, so care when selecting natives and then using some rock and other materials to help hold the skeleton of the design together when it's in decline is always a nice idea if you have the budget. Edible gardens are ever more popular. Um, there's a new trend in combining edible plants with horticultural plants to kind of maintain design integrity. Um, high value in using virtual water. So even though edibles tend to use a bit more water than regular plants, I mean a low water plant species, you're also producing food and um, harvesting it and limiting um, emissions from transportation and accomplishing sustainability in other ways. So, um, you know, and hopefully if you're in incorporating edibles, you're exploring some of the organic methods to reduce pests and diseases instead of relying on chemicals because you don't really want to put chemicals on things you're going to eat. So. Design solutions and challenges. Um, so we can design for curve appeal. Maybe we have a client that is planning to flip their house or move in a few months and they just want to make it an attention getting house so that people will notice it and it'll sell quickly. And we can do that by planting groups and big blocks or drifts of color to, to catch the eye as people are driving by at like 25 miles an hour. So these tend to be high contrast, simple designs, and that's what accomplishes curve appeal really well. Wayfinding can be challenging on some properties. This is an example of a development in Carlsbad where you can't really tell if the entrance is on the right or the left. So uh, by, by providing cues in the landscape, we can direct our guests who've maybe never been to our house, which way they would approach the house to get to the front door. So we do that through a direct line of sight with visual cues. We might widen a path on one side and we would make sure to not have overgrown areas. So here's an example of um, a taking back some turf, creating a wider path, and creating what we call some wayfinding in the landscape. So there's cues in this landscape that pull you around to the side of the house. You can see this wider path edged in bricks. So it's got some enhancements. There's some interesting, you know, pottery and this uh, focal point tree that you almost have to curve around it, a little seat out there. You can see this little pergola over the gate. Um, and if you had any doubt if you were supposed to go that direction, they've actually added an entrance sign pointing you around the side of the house. We can also mitigate some of our climate by the use of a well-placed tree. So, um, if you're trying to keep a house cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter, you would want to use a deciduous tree. 
because it's got the leafy canopy in the summertime and then does not have the leafy canopy in winter. So the sun can get through and warm the house. And there's some trade-offs, you know, it's you might lose some view versus some temperature um, savings. We want to avoid large trees close to structures if we're in a fire hazard area. And there are fire hazard maps um, posted throughout the whole state. So you can usually go log on and look at the city you're working in and try and look around for their fire hazard mapping and see if the parcel you're working on is in a fire hazard zone. If that's the case, we want to make sure that a mature tree, the can edge of the canopy would be at least 10 feet away from a house because we don't want to create a ladder fuel and, and, and damage the house. So, um, security. So if you have a house with an exposed corner, maybe there's been a lot of break-ins in the neighborhood, um, there's obvious security plants like these beaver tail cactus with the spikes all over it. But then you have plants that are in this category that aren't so obvious. So this is natal plum and it's got big long thorns in it and it functions like a really great security system. Um, and in this particular cultivar, stays low, stays about two and a half feet high, so it fits nicely under a window, and no one's gonna wanna tromp through that once they take a closer look at it. So a great way to kind of help protect, maybe if the house is on a corner and an exposed corner, um, you can plant for security. Um, privacy, so maybe we have neighbors who like to keep their trash cans so that every day we walk out of the house and that's what we look at we can put a, a very basic row of hedges to screen the view and create a wall of shrubs and it edged that. So be looking when you collect your, your data information at um, screen. Parkways and medians are super challenging. So if you think of them as linear gardens, sometimes that's helpful. Um, if you work with them, they are formal and rigid and they can kind of provide some structure to the area. So I think these are some nice examples of very linear designs within tight spaces. These happen to be kind of medians, at least on these two, um, but some interesting, interesting strategies to, um, to work with that difficult space. Um, you can also kind of create some curvilinear elements in this. Um, massings of soft plantings uh, can work well to soften that very linear form that comes inherently with a parkway or a median. So you can kind of see this, this drift of grasses, you know, through the, the location, softening that edge a little bit. Um, and then they can be naturalistic. Um, so this was a project I did and we just, we had a big native grassland turf renovation project and we created a California native meadow. And it was really cool because deer came up from the canyon and would, would kind of hang out in it at the end of the day. But we extended that treatment into the median um, and we were right on the edge of protected habitat. So it was a nice blending of our native systems and our, you know, the traditional horticultural system of that particular corporate campus. Um, but you can kind of see these meandered pockets of planting. Um, this one's more arid climate where it's a lot of gravel and boulders with just fewer shrubs, but all nice looking examples of what I would call naturalistic gardens. These, these areas can be used to um, incorporate um, water infiltration in it and help our natural hydrology of the region. So all of the three of these pictures have been designed to capture stormwater and slowly infiltrate it into the soil and recharge the soil water below the surface instead of just sending it into storm drains, into our creeks, and then out to the ocean. So harnessing, water banking, you know, understanding that there, there are opportunities to grab water and use it as a, on site and as a, a method to reduce reliance on um, 
more supplemental irrigation than maybe we need. And then um, some of the materials that might be used in landscapes or in these medians, you can have, this is kind of an interesting technique where if you tore up an old patio, if you do it kind of carefully and give the contractor instructions, you can reuse it almost as a paving material. So it's recycled concrete and it has a nickname of urbanite. Decomposed granite and cobbles, very popular in our region. So that's what those two materials look like. For decomposed granite, you can stabilize it and then they put it in lifts and they compact it. It almost becomes like a paving um, that you still have to make some repairs and filling you know, some more of the stone dust in, but it can be a real nice walkable surface. And then these are an, uh, what we call it a, a permeable type of paving. This is um, pavers, but they're, um, these are not interlocking. These are actually permeable because you can see they have a little bit wider of a joint and little small pebbles in there, little small tiny little rocks in there. If it were interlocking pavers that were impermeable, they would be really tight together and they would have almost like a sand brushed in there. And so they, they brush this cementitious sand and then they wet it down and that creates the, the impermeable layer to it. So that will do it for this lecture. I hope this recording helps those of you who are auditory learners. We'll talk to you next class.